Come on in. Come on into the living room here. Hi again. Um, if we are not at a high water mark for food in the United States right now, we are definitely, as we say on the water, on a flood tide. And two of the reasons for that are these women who sit up here with me today. Rux Martin, the legendary cookbook editor and publisher, and Gail Simmons, who you may know from a little show called A Little Bit. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about where we're going with home cooking and how the various media that they represent are changing that. Rox, I'm going to start with you with a kind of philosophical tough question. What are cookbooks for now? Uh, to cook from, <laughs> to inspire, to make you dream. I think they're about following, you know, being inspired enough to follow a narrative and to live in somebody else's life. Because you can get a recipe from anywhere. Um, you don't need a cookbook. But a cookbook is a narrative. Um, and I don't mean necessarily of the conventional sort. I'll, I do have one prop, and I'm going to use it. Rut row. Rut row. And it's not even my book. For those of you who can see this, this is Nathan Mirvold's latest five-volume, um, 625 book thing on the modernist bread. And this is the way books are blowing our world out of the water, even for those of us who publish $25 books of really uh, accessible recipes. So, OK. What we're looking at then, what I think you just said, is that books will inspire us. Books will lead us down. We can read this narrative. We can spend $625 to bake a loaf of bread. <laughs> I got it. I got it. On a parallel track, we have television. And Gail, you're the master of television. Can oh, you talk a goodness, little bit about what role TV is playing in, in how we're cooking and why? I'm listening to Rox talk about cookbooks, and I think there's an echo there, too. Um, I think television, food television, um, has changed enormously, especially over the last decade. And it serves a similar purpose, to dream, to inspire. Um, in the case of a lot of the television I do, which is actually not specifically about home cooking recipes, but about the world of food, the world of chefs. Um, it's to give people a window um, into a fantasy, a life that they don't often get to experience behind that kitchen door. Um, but ultimately, I think that it is, that television specifically allows us to, br allows us to sort of broaden our language about food and to learn about things that might not be within our reach yes. on the bookshelf. So both are aspirational. Yeah, it's to think big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Have, cookbooks weren't always that way, Rox. Yeah, I think they were. I mean, you think about um, the good ones were. You think about um, the, le the truly legendary Judith Jones, who is a, um, a Vermonter sometimes, <laughs> um, and Julia Child. The company I work at wouldn't consider, you know, got half a toe into the world of publishing um, mastering the art, and then decided that nobody in America wanted to listen to um, a uh, non-French woman talk about French recipes. So these kinds of challenges have always been there. And the really good cookbooks, the ones that last, are the ones that are the you know, big thinkers. When Maria Guarnaschelli, who is another legendary uh, cookbook editor, paid $600,000 for a book called Flatbread by Naomi Good Duguid and Jeffrey Alford. Um, many of us in the business, and I will admit I was one, said, you kidding? And Naomi and Jeffrey uh, went on to become um, pathway makers. Torontonians. <laughs> Canada in the house. Just saying. And so that was US dollars, by the way. <laughs> 
for us at the time. So, so um, both of these visions seem to be aspirational, right? It's about, uh, you know, I, wa I watch Top Chef, I'm, I'm, I think, well, I could cook better, I should cook better, and then I order Seamless, maybe. Or I actually go maybe. and cook. Or I, um, uh, buy, I take it alone, I buy Nathan's book, and I'm amazed by it, and do I jump in? Does, does a book like that, have the possibility to have an effect on the culture that is similar to Julia Child's with Mastering the Art of French Cooking. We're, yeah. No, no, we're not doing <coughs> advertising. And, and for me, it's not advertising. For me, because it's not my product. No, no, I hear you. For me, that image made me think about possibilities. I'm not going to buy that $625 book. I can't afford to. Well, maybe I could. But I'm not going to buy it, but it made me think of possibilities. It blew apart my conventional notions about how you publish a book on bread. Uh -huh. It's not product advertising. Is there a role in Top Chef for teaching people to cook beyond simply inspiring them? You know, at first. I'll go beyond yeah. for television as well. Sure. Um, I should say I started in publishing. Um, I came to television quite by accident. And when I first started on Top Chef specifically, um, I had never done, made any television before. I didn't aspire to make television. Um, and um, it was through publishing, through Food & Wine, that I went to sort of be their guinea pig to be on the show. And at first, I asked myself the same question. And actually, for probably two and a half years, I asked myself the same question. And then something started happening that made me change the way I measured what we were doing um, with our audiences and our viewers. And if the question is, are they cooking more? I wish I had that exact answer. But I do think that there is a way to see the effect that it's having um, if you sort of tweak the way that you're, that you're thinking about it. And that is that what started happening after about two years of, make, of me denying that I was a television person, um, but being on television, and, um, and that is that people would stop me in all sorts of places, mainly the grocery store or restaurants, because that's, I think, where people found the context of who I was, and otherwise they just thought we went to high school together or something like that. Um, <laughs> but mainly in the grocery store and in restaurants, people would stop me, and they would say, you've taught me something. Your show has taught me something. Um, it's actually usually Tom that does the teaching. I would <laughs> maybe. Um, giving the comic relief, I'm not sure. But, but, but the show and the genre has taught me something. You taught me what a chiffonade was. You got me watching this show with my kids, and now my son is 13, and he wants to cook dinner for us every night. So the question is, where then do we go? This inspi I feel basically 15 most of the time. So where do I, as a 15-year-old boy, go? And the answer <laughs> is the internet, for many reasons. Um, yes. The, yes. The, so true. And, and so this world, <laughs> this world of recipes on the internet seems to fill a, 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 not a void, but another part of the equation yes. that the inspiration of great narrative cookbooks and the inspiration of terrific, compelling food television. Now I'm going to actually cook, and, and I'm going and I'm typing in roast chicken recipe. Um, good luck with that recipe, by the way. You should, mm -hmm. if you go to mitcooking.com, maybe you'll find a good roast chicken recipe. That's what we're hoping anyway. But I'm curious what your relationships are um, to the world of internet cooking. That would be blogs with recipes, that would be the narrative mm -hmm. recipes of the, of the blog form, that would also be the endless uh, databases mm -hmm. that we can find, whether good, bad, or excellent, out there. And how's it affect, how, how, how does the presence of that world of recipes affect your life as a cookbook editor or acquirer? Well, certainly the standard um, question that I get whenever I go and somebody makes wants to make conversation other than do you actually test the recipes yourself is um, so cookbooks aren't doing well anymore because of the presence of the internet correct and the fact that I'm still at my company after God knows how long and you know probably 20 years now in the cookbook business mm -hmm. is a testimony to the fact um, that they're entirely wrong. Cookbooks are, have proved to be the most resilient of all books. 
Um, and it's, be, it's. Do you have a sense why they're being purchased? I do because. Well, tell us. It's about you. It's an entirely different experience than when I rush to my word processor and print out a last minute recipe for, I don't know, mushroom filled chicken that I can't find in my own cookbook. It's because you want to hold a book. It's on the other hand. Is it possibly because you want to give a book? Well, of course. So gifts are a big part uh, of the cookbook. Gifts are a part game. of it, but you also want to own one yourself. But I, I think I, I think to end there is to miss the message that the internet has provided so many new pathways, as you all know, to becoming um, a, a cookbook author. Um, you can be a superstar on YouTube and go anywhere you want, whereas before, you pretty much couldn't get into publishing or even into food magazines unless you were already a superstar. And thank God that, that those people on acquisition boards and um, places like that have to contend with the internet, have to realize, yeah, you have 1. million followers. Yeah, we have to publish this person. Gail, the internet plays a, a slightly different role uh, as a parallel to, mm -hmm. to, to your TV career in that when someone's saying, you taught me something, that's in the moment and that's an aspiration. But it seems to me that you have, or the, you know, the, the world around you has made a concerted effort to bring recipes and cooking instruction and the like into the kind of associated website with Top Chef. Sure. Well, there's, I mean, the, the existence of the internet has allowed us a lot more channels for reaching people because television is also very affected clearly by the internet in terms of ratings. The, the way we rate who's watching television has completely changed. Um, Nielsen has completely changed. Um, um, the DVR has completely changed the game, and so have not you know, alternative cable, um, Netflix and Amazon, which, by the way, has also really helped us all get more cookbooks into our houses, yeah. because now there's free shipping. If you, you know, like there is, there is endless channels that that has allowed us more access and reach, um, and also ways to get people to watch television who don't own televisions anymore. Right. Right. Um, and so, um, one of the things that that we were really proud of that we did with Top Chef in that uh, vein is that we started what, what in our first season of doing it, they called, we called transmedia. I'm not sure that term really yeah, caught on. Yeah, um, not in this community. <laughs> right? But, um, but, you know, true. Thank you. But, <laughs> but, but really, um, we took the show and put a piece of the show online so that in order to understand the full narrative on you know Wednesdays or now Thursdays at 10 p.m., uh, you had to also watch a piece of it online, which got which which grew and and um, allowed us to reach a, a much larger audience. Um, it wasn't about the recipes, but it was about getting more people engaged with what we were talking about. And then there's the piece of how it affects chefs, which is what our show is about. Right. So what's interesting is that's a primary, I mean, there's some, there are some words there, but it's very, very visual. And I, I think that the visual nature, both of the, of, of the show and the adjacent blog, uh, adjacent website and the world of blogs, which is so visually driven, has had a clear effect mm -hmm. on cookbooks. Mm -hmm. And if we think, you know, we, we we can wax on about the golden age of cookbooks, but if you think about, say, an Elizabeth David cookbook, were it published today with these liquid and perfect sentences and mm -hmm. great recipes, mm -hmm. like, it would, would it sell? There are no glossy pictures? Like, how much has photography and the cost of photography and the need to style and the like had an effect on how you do business? I'm sorry to say that it has had a huge effect. Um, Probably the most regrettable thing is the evolution of the publishing industry as a business. Um, all of us have to run net margins on the books we acquire. The cost, almost all cookbooks now have to be full color in order to sell across all outlets. Um, and obviously photography is expensive, but it, the main cost, of course, is um, printing. Um, so obviously, in order to make those costs work, you have to have an author 
with a great deal of staying power because in years two, three, four, and onward, you can hope to recoup those costs. So on the one hand, you know, you got one million followers on your Instagram, so you get the book contract, but then you got to earn out. Oh, it gives me a headache. It's so difficult. Yeah, but your, adva your advance is so huge that usually the publisher <laughs> loses. <laughs> it's a racket. We're going to take some questions from the audience if, if you have any for these magical women. Yes, in the back. Hi, this may be more from the publishing perspective, but say in music, you're seeing that the internet has completely changed the business model. I'm wondering, uh, from the cookbook perspective, are we seeing similar dynamics uh, in terms of where revenue streams are changing or how you guys have to deal with uh, the digital disruption? Well, we, we definitely put an ebook out um, the second we do a cookbook. Um, only about 5% of it, that only accounts to 5% of users, so it's a fraction of the industry. Um, uh, sorry. But when you put an ebook out, it's a it's a PDF that I can swipe through on my yeah. my Kindle. It's not an app where I can search for chicken fricassee. Yes, I think he I think he had another part of the question though. Did you? Yeah. How are you handling that? <laughs> um, it's fine. We still get the revenue. Beautiful. On this side, yes, sir. So my question is for Gail. Uh, you know, if I think about cooking on television, there's been this migration from instructional shows. For instance, I learned more from Malto Mario than I learned in college, mm -hmm. I think. Um, <laughs> but now it's all competitive based. Is there simply not an audience? And we think about the aspiration of this conference. Is there simply not an audience any longer for instructional based cooking shows? Uh, it's a good question. It's one I ask myself a lot, too. Um, and I feel like we are the, um, the problem and the solution sort of all at once. We, we get people excited about food, but we're also not providing them with instruction on how to cook food specifically and what um, our show does. Um, and, and I think it's not so much that there isn't an audience, and I would be curious to hear what like the head of a television network would say about this, because I'm certainly not the head of a television network. Um, but I think that the audience, the, the prime time audience, which is very, very different than the daytime audience, and the daytime audience seems to be the audience that's still watching instructional cooking. Um, but the prime time audience um, tastes have certainly changed. And uh, prime time has not seen success. Maybe they never did, um, because instructional cooking never lived in prime time. Right, it was always um, a daytime thing. It was always play. a daytime thing. So I think, yes, the same way that we want to just see a beautiful picture and we don't want to read a 2,000-piece story anymore about an ingredient. Uh, we just want to see a picture of that ingredient and swipe to the next picture. Um, I think in some ways that's true of what we want on television. There's action and competition and narrative and arc that uh, we want to see. Um, but I think it's more about when we're watching it than what we're watching. Rux, you wanted to jump in there. I do. And, and in terms of instructional television, don't tell Jacques Pepin that that um, model doesn't work anymore because I publish Jacques and <laughs> each year is bigger. It's yeah. huge. And I think in terms of that gentleman's question, um, the way you, know, you can control when you watch Jacques any time you want. And I think that's at the root of what is going on now, that you guys and Gail and I and you all can control the content of what you watch and when you watch and what you read and when you read and how, what device you do it through, including a book. And for what purpose, whether you're Correct. seeking uh, yeah. inspiration or seeking relief from the terrors of the workday or whether you just want to cook yeah. something. Should we try another? Yes, in the back. Hi, um, I'm curious to hear of, of from both of you about what you would like to see more of, say, in the next two or five years from cookbooks and also from food television. You start so I can think. Sure. <laughs> I'm just going to start and not think. <laughs> um, I guess. You know, I still, I, we're seeing a little more, but I want to see um, more, te specifically television, um, that kind of reflects how we all are really eating and, and living um, a little. I th and I think things are airing this way because of 
Instagram and because of um, the visual nature of how we consume media, um, like the messiness of life. And um, I think that I want to see more female voices in prime time, which there's also not a lot of, by the way, on food television specifically. Almost no hmm. female leads of prime time television in the food space. Um, and so that's what I want to see, because um, that's still the majority of the people who are cooking the food in the houses that we're living in. Um, and so sort of a reflection of you know, that, that conversation. Um, so Gail, I run a network. I actually run yeah, a television you, network. You do. And uh, I'm, thinking, I'm, I'm liking what I'm hearing. What's your elevator pitch for Sorry. our 9 PM show? Uh, let's see. That's a good idea. I mean, let's talk. Um, <laughs> You know, the elevator's it, going up. It's true. I know the elevator's going up two seconds. <laughs> and I would say that, you know, I really do want to see, like, collaboration instead of competition, I guess, is what I want to see. And that might not be so sexy, and that's why we're not seeing a lot of it. Mm, um, okay, I'll have my people call that's you. That's what I want to see. Do so I have a chance now? I'm, like, sweating. <laughs> Brox, do you want to take a cut at this? Yeah, I'll take a cut. Um, I, I truly don't look for um, people. Agents call me up and say, so what are you looking for? I'm looking for people who are talented, who have, who are good at long form, who are, whose knowledge is wide and deep. I'm not looking for, you know, the next book on potatoes. I'm looking for somebody who has like a deep grounding in whatever they're um, writing on. So, you know, whatever. But you've been getting that throughout your career. That's what you demand. What do you do? What would you change? What do you want to see in the future? Recognizing that we're seeing this flood of cooking yeah. inspiration coming from Instagram, coming from blogs, and coming from television. What I would change is I would be more open to young voices. I would be. I have been very conservative in what I acquire, and that has stood me very well in terms of money making. But I wish that I had um, a shout out here, but not. I wish I had published Molly on the Range. Mm -hmm. I wish I had published Molly Weisenberg. Maybe I have a thing for women named Molly. I, have, I wish I was the only editor of I don't know, 12 or 13, to turn down, gasp, Julie and Julia, because they couldn't figure out how to make it a book. So I wish that my brain was a little less fossilized. <laughs> you and me both, Ross, yeah, yeah. you and me both. <laughs> I wish I weren't so old. <laughs> I'm just happy a lot of those people showed up in the Times food section before they got their book contracts. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, um, this is the era of home-cooked meals. What would you have to say as far as inspiration for families to cook meals and what you would provide for them? Gail, you go. Um, I, I like to say that uh, what, we, what we provide, um, specifically with, with the shows that I do and why we're really proud of them, and, and at first felt like it was just a sidebar, but now I think it's really the point, um, is the, uh, the confidence to pick something new at the grocery store and take it home and try it. Mm -hmm. The confidence to go to a restaurant that you, and order something on the menu that you otherwise wouldn't have ordered. Mm -hmm. Or to read a menu and recognize words and ingredients and terms that you wouldn't have otherwise recognized and, and, and feel confident in ordering them and excited about what they are going to taste like and trying new things and um, going on a little adventure. And, and not being afraid that food will bite you back. And for my part, um, I live in Vermont, and that means that um, I don't take on books that I can't cook, because we don't get ingredients like you get in New York City. So we, I'm a real family home cook, and that is both a strength of what I publish and a drawback. It makes me less imaginative. Well, I hope that all of us want to write and read Rux Martin books and make television with Gail. <laughs> I thank them both for joining us at Food for Tomorrow. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.